So I read everyone's bios in advance of today and didn't really expect there to be so many points of intersection between all of our stories and all of our experiences, but it's sort of reaffirming that uh, we're more alike than we think. And it's, it's very sort of gratifying to know that amongst this quite humbling panel of women that there are those points of intersection. Um, so I will also take Ophira's lead in terms of um, outlining some of those kind of main things that I, that I sort of distilled my 10 minutes down to when thinking about preparing for today. Um, I think the first one would be pursue your passions relentlessly. I think that I'm a person that's very tenacious and I think that my tenacity and willingness to go to the ends of the earth to achieve some of my objectives um, is something that has been very fulfilling and it has definitely paid off for me. So pursue your passions relentlessly. Uh, the second piece I would say is definitely be open-minded to the opportunities that come your way. If someone was to ask me to look back um, 10 or 15 years, do you think you'd be where you are today? And I think absolutely I would have no idea that I would be in this position now. I think I've, it's sort of a lot of happenstance. Cultivating a network around me of people that know some my objectives and goals, um, taking a lot of opportunities to do further training and education, and really just doing really well at the things that I'm doing in my paid work and also in my unpaid work so that those opportunities arise that you couldn't possibly have calculated or planned for. Uh, I think the third piece is absolutely network, uh, volunteer, and raise funds. I think that uh, leaving it to the government to be the sole funder of health and to be the sole contributor to advancing the women's health agenda, I think, is is um, short-sighted. I think that we should put our money where our mouth is and support causes that are important and organizations that are really doing that important work in addition to the work that the government does fund. Um, the fourth piece is, I think, definitely uh, contribute to systemic change. Uh, even if you're not a researcher, which I absolutely am not, think of ways that you can be involved in research or other opportunities to sort of ad advance your uh, your profession or, or the work that you're doing. So by joining professional associations, getting a part of research projects as a lay person, I think is an invaluable experience. Um, the fifth piece I would say is, is definitely appreciating and understanding the, the cultural perspective that you bring to the table and using that to your advantage and also being really aware of the diverse and nuanced ways of doing things that many other ethnocultural groups um, look at health and I think that that will bring you forward if you can um, be able to identify with very different ways of doing things and very different perspectives I think that makes you a very well-rounded professional. And I think the last piece um, that I wanted to touch on was mentorship. And I'll put it out there. Anyone that would like to add me to LinkedIn or be connected in any way, I'm very open to that. It's, uh, you know, I think I've been very fortunate that I've had incredible mentors and a personal board of directors throughout my career. And it's something that I very much appreciate and that's helped me move forward. So in any way, small, tiny, microscopic way, connect you with someone that you want to be connected to. If I can facilitate that, that's my honor and I would be more than happy to do so. So I was asked to sort of think a little bit about my, my career path and um, I'll actually go back a little bit further than when I started working and my first sort of intersection with women's health was when I was volunteering at my local hospital as a high school student. And one of the first memories that I have of that experience was working in um, a geriatric um, uh, ward and there was an individual that was there week after week. I, I went for my first week of training and, and encountered this individual. And week after week, I would, I would show up for my shift on Saturdays from 9 till 12. And this person was there, and, and they didn't have any visitors, and they didn't speak English. And they would often get very agitated, and their needs were clearly not being met. Sure, they were getting their pills at the specific time that they needed to get their pills, um, but they had no other social outlets because they weren't able to communicate with any of the nurses on the ward or any of the other patients. And I think that, for me, distills um, where I became very passionate about health and health equity and having everyone of various backgrounds, linguistic backgrounds, ethnocultural backgrounds, religious backgrounds, be able to participate in their own health care um, and really to be able to advocate for themselves. So I think that was sort of that first moment where I became very passionate about health. Fast forward, I went to university at McMaster and chose to uh, pursue a public policy degree in the School of Political Science. And I was became very, very plugged into the uh, peer health education movement at McMaster. I ran the Student Wellness Center and was the outreach coordinator at our sexual health center. 
And again, I that cultural competence bumped up against the sexual health center quite frequently. Um, in our role there, we acted as peer mentors to individuals wanting counseling around their sexual health, wanted pregnancy tests, access to free condoms, that sort of thing. And I remember one particular morning, a young girl who was a international student had come in and uh, she had some, what I thought were fairly basic questions about her sexual health. And I realized in talking with her a little bit further that she would come from a very different place where sex was not talked about openly whatsoever and had missed out on some of those critical p components that I took for granted having been educated in Canada where grade six you have that sexual health curriculum. And again, that nuanced approach you to talking... You didn't get the Disney movie on menstruation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I definitely didn't get that one. <laughs> So that was, uh, again, where that cultural competence piece and being able to modify my style and really understand that this person is my peer, but they have a very different lived experience than me and being able to adapt and, and find a commonality with that individual to be able to speak on that level um, really is something that I probably won't forget. And then I had a conversation with my supervisor at the Student Wellness Center, and she said to me, Tanya, you're, you're doing great. You're, you're so involved in the peer health education movement here at McMaster. You seem to really enjoy it. You, you, you volunteer for every activity and event that we have. Have you thought about pursuing a career in public health? Well, I said to her, well, you know I'm in the political science faculty, so I'm not going to be a registered health professional. How could I possibly work in public health? And she was like, well, I used to work in public health, and there's roles called health promoters and policy analysts, and you don't need to be a registered health professional to be able to continue doing the work that you're essentially doing now in a paid capacity after you graduate. This is amazing. I had no idea. Um, so from there, I got plugged into my local public health unit and started working on a part-time basis doing um, mental health promotion work in the high schools through a program called um, TAMI. I don't know if some of the public health people in the room might know of that program. And from there, um, pursued a career in, in public health as a health promoter doing work in chronic disease prevention. Had the fortunate opportunity to work with um, our now defunct Ontario Ministry of Health Promotion and Sport doing work around Smoke Free Ontario, as well as a Provincial Obesity Strategy and Healthy Eating Active Living Strategy. And I found that work to be incredibly gratifying, but I sort of felt, again, I had this, um, the tenacity piece comes in here, I'm like, there's more. I'm doing something, and I know in 10 years the population health curve might just shift over a little bit, but what more can I do to contribute to my field, my profession, and really feel like I'm giving back? And um, from there, got very plugged into internationally, nationally, and at, and at a provincial level, the various um, health associations and professional bodies that govern public health in Canada and, and North America, and uh, got involved as well with a research project that came up. Um, we wanted to do some evaluation work around um, the healthy eating active living strategy that we were developing, so decided hey, I don't know too much about research, but it's a skill I'd like to you know, learn more about and, and possibly contribute in that way so that this work isn't just you know, hopefully going to make a change in 10 years. We can actually measure its effectiveness and really ensure that we're going down the right path. Um, and from there, I got plugged into an organization called the International Union for Health Promotion and Education, uh, IUHP. And um, one day on the listserv came out an email saying there's this incredible program, a summer institute at NYU with the World Health Organization. Uh, applications are due in a couple weeks, and I thought, well, it looks expensive, so oh, I'm going to apply. <laughs> um, it looks incredible, and I'll figure it out. If I get in, then I'll figure out a way to pay for it and get there and get my boss to approve me going away for two months. And I was fortunate enough to be accepted to the program, and to my surprise, and perhaps it's a testament to the tenacity, um, my manager felt that it was a great use of my time, a great professional development opportunity, so sent me to New York, and that was quite an eye-opening experience. Um, I was the only individual from North America in the program. There were 26 others in the program. Everyone spoke a minimum of three languages, and pretty much everyone worked in a rural a program around HIV AIDS prevention. So these were all UN and WHO staffers working in extreme conditions to say the least. And so it came point to the point in the first week of our class where we had to decide what project we wanted to work on. The idea was to really work on something real life that we could then bring back to our, our day to day and, and to our work. And so I'm sort of the, you know, the person from Halton region, uh, where you know some of the highest uh, per capita income in probably the world, um, and I'm like, 
well, the project I was going to work on doesn't seem as relevant to anybody here. So I ended up joining a project that um, one of my other classmates, who happened to be Canadian, living in Vietnam, was working on. And the project was around Agent Orange cleanup in Vietnam. And I thought, couldn't be more obscure, couldn't be farther from my my day-to-day, -day, I'm going to join that project group. And I'm glad that I did. Um, we had the opportunity to really understand that Agent Orange is still a factor in the environment in the sites where it was transported over in, in, um, in Vietnam and got to create an incredible project that focused on women as catalysts for change, as heads of households, the ones that really control what their families consume. And diet was the number one reason that Agent Orange and dioxin was getting into people's bodies was through fishing um, in not so clean environments um, in contaminated sites. And the work that we did there um, ended up being uh, won an award and the WHO is now implementing that project in Vietnam. So again, it was about understanding a, a demographic that I knew absolutely nothing about and doing everything possible in that time to really understand and appreciate the cultural nuances of working with this population that I had never interfaced with. So again, that, that cultural piece kind of bumps up again in my in, in my experience. Fast forward back, I've come back to uh, to public health, and I'm still feeling a little hungry for for more. I feel like I can contribute more, and um, a program called the Diversity Fellows Program came out, and a friend of mine sent it to me in an email and said you should apply. So I decided to apply again. Why not put it out there and see what happens? And was happy enough to be chosen. Again, it was a group of 27 of us from around Toronto, and it ended up being put in this group with some fascinating characters. We had a vice president of RBC, we had a playwright, we had an individual that worked with transgender youth, we had a major gifts officer from United Way, we had a deputy director from CAMH. So couldn't be more diverse. Some born in Canada, some born on the other side of the world, some refugees, some Canadian born. It was a fascinating social experiment. But the idea was to do a city building project that really advanced the city of Toronto in some way Oh, two minutes. I will be or quick. Or less, actually. You missed the last one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, TikTok. And so... But it's good. It's really good. <laughs> sorry. I didn't realize it was so long-winded. Someone said 10 minutes is a long time, but I guess it really isn't. Um, so we ended up choosing a project to do culturally competent mental health programming for South Asian women in one of the North Toronto United Way priority neighbourhoods. And again, a fascinating experience to work with a very diverse group of stakeholders and to really think about mental health in a very different way. You don't say the words mental health with this particular group that we were working with. And that experience, again, has sort of informed and shaped some of the, the things I felt I've contributed to women's health. Um, wrapping up, I um, can't, can't sort of discount the fact of who pays my bills uh, or helps me pays my, pay my bills. Um, after that project wrapped up, I was still hungry for more and decided that uh, I could contribute to, to health and to women's health and chronic disease prevention in another way. So I chose to pursue an opportunity with the Heart and Stroke Foundation in fundraising, which was a complete departure from my background and my policy background and the work that I'd been doing with uh, with public health. But it felt like an, the right opportunity to continue to make systemic change, um, help people that have been personally impacted by heart disease and stroke, which is probably every single one of us in this room, help them achieve their philanthropic dreams and, and their wishes and actually help see that fun, those funds go into research that will, again, change the population health curve maybe faster, but in a different way. So I think I, I've taken a very circuitous, <laughs> uh, unlikely path to contributing to women's health, but it's uh, one that I wouldn't change, and um, thank you. Thank you.